Welcome to Christ United Methodist Church traditional worship service in Farmer's Branch. I'm David Scroggin, one of the ministers of the church, and we are so happy that we can all worship together online. If this is your first time to turn into us and come to our church online, I want to say welcome to you. Welcome in the name of Jesus Christ. I would encourage you to go to our webpage. There's a lot of great information there about our church. If you'd like to speak to one of the ministers, please email us or give us a call, and we will get back with you as soon as possible. As we continue now into worship, let us turn our minds from human things. Let us set our minds on divine things. Our faith in Jesus saves us. We will deny ourselves and take up our cross. We will lose all that we may gain all. Our faith in Jesus saves us. Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is the one true church, apostolic and universal, whose holy faith let us now declare, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he arose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good morning, everyone. It's Miss Amy, and it's time for children's time. I'm so glad that you're here with me today. So tell me, do you like to play board games? I love board games. And some of the most popular board games are games like checkers and chess, Monopoly, Trivial Pursuit, Clue. Well, one of the most popular games ever 
is the game of life. Did you know that that was introduced over 150 years ago? That's a really long time. The game of life is actually played very much like real life. At the beginning of the game, each player must choose the path that he or she is going to take through the journey of their life. They choose whether they're going to go to college or go out and get a job. And as the game goes on, each player spins the wheel and moves their car, the number of spaces on which the spinner stops. The space where your car lands gives you directions on what to do. Now on some of the spaces, you must follow the directions. On other spaces, you only have to follow the directions if you want to. Just as in real life, you have many choices to make along the way. But what happens in the game of life depends on the choices you make. Now, at the end of the game, the player with the most money wins. Wait, what? Well, is that true in real life? Do you think that when life is over, the one with the most money wins? Well, today we're going to hear what Jesus has to say about that. In our Bible story today, Jesus was teaching his followers about life. He said to them, if you want to be my follower, you must turn away from selfishness, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you will lose it. But if you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel, you will save it. After all, what good is it if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your own soul? Some people live as if the most important thing in life is getting more stuff. Big houses and fancy cars and new games and pretty clothes. Others live as if the most important thing in life is following Jesus and serving him. When Jesus lived on earth, Everything he did was for others. If we follow his example, he promised that we will be winners in the game of life. Well, how about you? Do you want to be a winner in the game of life? Well, then today, let's stop thinking about ourselves and start thinking about others. Let's pray. Dear God, Thank you for today. Please help us follow the example that Jesus set to give up our selfish ways and give our lives in love and service to others. We love you, God. In your holy name we pray. Amen.
As we prepare to go to God in prayer, there are several people who would like for us to pray for them. I ask that you notice the screen in a few moments, and you'll see people's names there, some you know, some you may not know, but they have asked for our church to pray for them. I also would like to ask you today to pray for the people in your heart that you know, someone that's in your family, a friend, a neighbor, that you know is having a struggle right now. And let's ask that you pray for that situation and those people. And also, just ask God for your own personal spiritual growth to come closer to Him. At this time, let us go to God in silent meditation. Today, as we bow in prayer on this second Sunday in Lent, may we hear from Scriptures, from the One who said, I am God Almighty, El Shaddai. I am the Lord your God. I am who I am. I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. Holy God, on our Lenten journey, Convict us to spend more time in Your Word. Let us not rush through Your Word. We appear to have little patience when it comes to time. Lord, we live in a society that insists on speed, immediate results, instant food, overnight shipping, information at our fingertips. If it can't happen quickly, we often will become frustrated and tempted to give up and walk away. Lord, forgive us when we speed through life. We pray for spiritual eyes and ears to experience Your fullness in time. During our Lenten journey, may we revisit our Bible, our spiritual roots, our salvation, our baptism, our commitment, our giving, our witness, our church. Almighty God, convict us to stay in Your Word. Walk in Your Spirit. Be receptive and responsive as You plant Your Word in our heart. We pray that You would grow our character and stretch our faith. Lord, we confess that sometimes our Bible reading is dry. Many of us may need a jump start today. Holy God, we pray now, today may be the new beginning we're looking for. Lord, during our Lenten journey, now to Easter, let us recommit to reading Your Word daily and listening to Your answer for our lives. May we focus on Your Holy Word that assures us that true life is found within Your written Word. Lord, Your Holy Word has taught us to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be Thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us of our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For Thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
In worship, we have the opportunity to give of our tithes and our offering. And our gifts today will not only help this church, but it will help churches all over the globe. Many missionaries, many people in mission, universities, schools, hospitals. I know that you would like to give to that, that offering today to help others. On your screen, you will see different ways how to give to our church. And in return, we will be good stewards of our gifts to help advance the kingdom of God. Let us have our prayer of thanksgiving. God of all, You love us and have claimed us. As You bless Sarah and Abraham, You have invited us into the blessing of connection with You. And all the family of humanity, we give our tithes and offering in celebration of the depths of our blessings and pray that they will strengthen the church across the world to bless all Your children. In the holy name of Christ our Savior, our Redeemer, we pray in gratitude. Amen. Good morning. My name is Darren Gardner. I'm your lay reader this morning, the second Sunday of Lent. Please join me in the prayer for illumination. Loving God, by your Holy Spirit, open our hearts and minds that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may be led into your truth and taught your will for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The first scripture is from Genesis chapter 17, verses 1 through 7 and 15 through 16. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to Abram and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will make you exceedingly numerous. Then Abram fell on his face and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You shall be the ancestor of a multitude of nations. No longer shall your name be Abram, but your name shall be Abraham. For I have made you the ancestor of a multitude of nations. I will make you exceedingly fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings shall come from you. I will establish my covenant between me and you and your offspring after you throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God with you and to your offspring after you. God said to Abraham, as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her Sarai, but Sarah will be her name. I will bless her, and moreover, I will give you a son by her. I will bless her, and she shall give rise to nations. Kings of people shall come from her. And from Mark chapter 8, verse 31 through 38. Then he began to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo great suffering and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the scribes, and be killed, and after three days rise again. He said all this quite openly, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But turning and looking at his disciples, he rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan, for you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. He called the crowd with his disciples and said to them, If any want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and the sake of the gospel will save it. For what will it profit them to gain the whole world and forfeit their life? Indeed, what can they give in return for their life? Those who are ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation of them the Son of Man will also be ashamed when He comes in the glory of His Father with holy angels. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Hello. My name is Pastor Scott. People call me Pastor Scott. Pastor is a title. Scott, my name. My given name. However, it's not my first given name. It's my middle name. But I'm one of a few people in the world, or perhaps many, who prefer not their first name, but their middle name. I did not give myself my first name or my middle name. They were given to me by my parents, as most of you were given your name. 
And sometimes later in life, our name might change. It often happens with marriage, either by taking on a new name or, in some cases, combining names to form a new hyphenated name. That's how I got my current surname. Names, many times, are not chosen, they are given. And occasionally, we might change them. Even our nicknames often are not of our own choosing. They're sort of placed on us. Like I doubt Thomas, the disciple, would have chosen the nickname Doubting Thomas. But that's what we gave him. But names are important, and they do identify us. And they do change over time. I just share this because names are very important in the Scriptures today that we've read, both from the Old Testament and the New Testament. Just briefly to remind you, in the Old Testament reading, we hear about the renaming of the patriarchs of Abraham and Sarah, whose names did not begin as Abraham and Sarah. Originally, their names, Abram and Sarai, were actually more individualistic names. Abram meant exalted father, even though he wasn't a father biologically. And Sarai meant princess, exalted father and princess. However, God gave them a new name. To Abram, he became Abraham, which means father of many. And Sarai, Sarah, became princess to many. So it's interesting. Their names changed from names that were very individualistic, father, princess, to names that really related to others, father of many, princess to many, and how really their identities would be formed and how God was going to be working through them to create and to call into existence this new community, this new family, this family of God. This covenant that began with Abraham and Sarah. And so for a long time, the descendants of Abraham and Sarah would look back and remember how God called them and created them into this new family. And they got this name, people of God the Israelites. That's who they were. That's how they identified themselves. And throughout such a long, long history, until we come to the time of Jesus, our Christ, the people of Israel had had this long, long history of trying to understand who they were. Through that covenant long ago started by Abraham and Sarah, when they became the father of of many, and a princess to many. Names are important. Who we belong to are important. Still, in our very day, our identities often begin with our families, whether they're our birth families or our adopted families. That's how we get our identity. For good or for bad, that's who we are. And we live out our life either embracing that, sometimes pushing against that, and oftentimes in the middle. But where we belong is an important thing. And so often, it begins with the idea of family, who we belong to. Sometimes our identity is moved beyond simply family as we think about country. Or perhaps we think about it in terms of our religious affiliation, whether that name is Christian or Methodist. These names say something about us, who we are or where we came from, sometimes where we want to go. I say this because as we enter into the, the story from Gospel of Mark today, 
the second week of Lent. We look at the, the idea and the identity of the disciples understanding who Jesus is and as followers of Jesus, who they are. And it does center around one name in particular. And that name is Messiah. Messiah is a Hebrew word that means the anointed one. And it's a word with a long and rich history in Israel's past. And it had come by the time of the day of Jesus. To be that name of the one, the servant of God who would come to lead God's people. There was a connotation to it by the time of Christ that particularly zoned in on the idea of the Messiah as one who would lead God's people out of bondage. Now, there are many aspects to this historical understanding of the word Messiah. But in this particular historical context in the first century, the Messiah was seen by many primarily to be the one who would come to lead God's people out of bondage, this time from the Roman Empire. So that was a word that was often heard. In fact, in Israel in this time, there were many people who claimed the name Messiah. In the Greek, it was Christ, anointed one in Greek. So Christ in Messiah, same word, different language. But there were many in the first century who claimed to be Messiah, the Christ, who wanted to lead Israel out of its bondage to the Roman Empire. These insurrectionists were many. And so it was a word that everyone knew. And it was a word in Mark, a name in Mark, that Jesus often tried to avoid. Because it seemed everyone had this idea of Messiah, Christ, in their head. And for many, for many, it was a very violent term of what the Messiah was going to do. Raise an army, lead the people to freedom. Maybe even the disciples had that idea. Now, they had been following Jesus now for a while, and they had seen all the wonderful things that Jesus was doing. And perhaps in their minds, they're also thinking and anticipating what Jesus is going to do. And you haven't seen anything yet. Wait till Christ truly begins to, to challenge the Romans. This has not happened yet. Jesus has been preaching and teaching and sharing good news. Remember last week, in the beginning, uh, first week of Lent, we talked about how Mark summarized the advent of Jesus. The time is fulfilled. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the good news. Now, part of that, for the disciples following Jesus, may have meant to them believing in the good news that Jesus has brought the kingdom of God so close that Jesus would be the one to rescue them from the Romans. So what's all going on dealing with this name, Messiah, or this title, Christ? And the disciples are following, trying to understand all the things Jesus is doing. But there's an important change, a demarcation in the Gospel of Mark here in this chapter as Jesus will begin to talk to the disciples about that very name, Messiah. He doesn't actually bring it up. He asks the disciples a question. Who do people think that I am? This occurs right before today's reading. Jesus is actually taking the disciples far north to a place called Caesarea Philippi. Caesarea Philippi is a very political place. It's a 
a place in history that goes back to really profound association with some of the gods of earlier times. It was a very pagan area. Now dedicated to the name of Philip. And so in this kind of hotbed of of politics in ancient Israel, Jesus asked the disciples, who do you think that I am? Or first, who the people think that I am? And you remember, they say, oh, lots of different things. Some people think you're John the Baptist, come back to life, or you're the prophet Isaiah. You may remember Jesus says to them, who do you think I am? And this profound moment, that's when Peter will stand and say, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. And when Peter says that, Jesus acknowledges that he is correct. And still tells them, don't tell anybody. Those people will get the wrong idea. And we pick up today in the Gospel of Mark, immediately following that conversation, where Jesus hears Peter say, you are the Messiah. And Jesus will begin to teach. He will teach the disciples what it is for him to be the Messiah, the Christ. It's a hard teaching that they obviously are not ready to hear. But Mark tells us Jesus begins to teach this and to talk about what is coming. And really, from this point on in Mark, we're headed to Jerusalem and we're headed to the cross. But Jesus begins to teach them. And the words that he uses to teach them about who he is are not words they're ready to hear because they are words like suffering. That they are words that denote for them pain, humiliation. And they are words that they cannot in their mind associate with Jesus, the one who has healed, the one who has proclaimed God, the one who has done so much that they feel the power and authority of God right in front of them. And so for them, it is just beyond their thought for Jesus to be one who would suffer so, particularly to suffer the pain and humiliation of Roman crucifixion. And so here's another word, cross. That word cross was a word that brought about for most people in the first century in Israel, fear. It was a word you really didn't want to hear and think about. The cross was the Roman Empire's way of controlling, dominating the people that they have subjugated. It was a threat for the people to fall in line. Along the roads that would go into any city, that was controlled by the Roman Empire would have on display persons crucified, a sign to people, again, that we are in charge and you must follow us. So this image of the cross combined with the Messiah is not something that the disciples are ready to hear at all. In fact, we don't really want to hear it, do we? Even for us, that word cross denotes pain and suffering. And we have not had to walk down a street where people crucified are on the sides. So when Jesus starts teaching that, the disciples become very uncomfortable. In fact, so that Peter will attempt to escort Jesus out from the group and to chastise him, if you will, to rebuke him, saying, we're not going to 
no, let's not talk about that. We're not going to talk about that. This is, this is crazy. This is impossible. And it's Jesus who will utter famous words to Peter. Get behind me, Satan. You are thinking like the world, not like God. And that had to hurt Peter, who we all know, we all know, he was the, the leader of the disciples. He was a strong and vocal leader. And to be told that in front of everybody had to hurt. But he put himself in that position. And so it's following that that Jesus begins to share these really famous and powerful words about how Peter and the other disciples need to fall behind Jesus to follow. And in fact, you may notice in the story, it wasn't just to Peter and the remaining 11 disciples we are so close in understanding. He gathered other people in. I think this is a very public teaching. And says, if you want to follow me, you are going to have to deny yourself and even pick up a cross. And so that's a phrase that we focus a lot on in Lent the season leading up to the cross. And what does it mean to deny yourself and take up a cross? Now, we'll share just historically, take up the cross refers to how a person who is condemned by the Romans, a criminal in the Roman mindset, how that criminal is crucified is by being forced to carry the bar, the transverse bar of the cross from where they are, where they receive their, their sentence. That they have to carry it through the streets to the place where they will be crucified. And most commonly, that crossbar, that transverse bar, is tied to actually a rooted tree beside the road or wherever it is. So they carry that cross piece through the city, and it is humiliating, and it is anguish. And so that image, that phrase, take up your cross, has a very distinct meaning. No one wants to take up a cross. If you take up a cross, someone's going to nail you to it. But before Jesus says that, he says this, deny yourself to take up a cross. And just for a moment, that word deny. This word deny used here in Mark is the same word used with Peter later in the story. Remember, after Jesus is arrested, Peter is in the courtyard and he's warming himself by the fire and people begin to associate him with Jesus. And they begin to ask Peter if he is with Jesus. Do you, you know this Jesus, right? You're with him. And you may remember that Jesus is denied by Peter three times. And that word for deny that is used in those three denials where Peter says literally, I don't know who he is. That's what the word denial meant. I don't know him. I don't know Jesus. It's deserve the same word, the same meaning. So Jesus says to us, you must deny yourself. And so often we, we might go to that idea of denial and think about it as simply just not permitting ourselves to, to do certain things or to enjoy certain things or to hold certain things. But Literally, as you compare it to the context of Peter's denial, it means, strangely, to deny ourselves means that we say to ourselves, I don't know you. Now, obviously, 
we don't just have amnesia and we suddenly don't know who we are. But here's a powerful statement where we are saying to yourself, you don't know who you are. I don't know who I am. And so now, as one who does not know who you are, how will you find out who you are? Who will tell you who you are? How will you know who you are? So if we deny ourselves and we are no longer aware of who we are by following Jesus, that's where we learn who we are. That's where we learn who we are. It's like getting a new name. A new reality. And that's what Jesus says. If you're following me, you're denying who you were. And you're becoming a new creature. A new person. And we think that often, don't we? When we think about our baptism and our, our joining the church, We go into the waters. We wash away our past. We even die to ourselves and we come out of the waters a new person. Jesus says you deny yourself. You don't know who you are. You have chosen not to know who you are so that you can be formed anew. Anew in the image of God follow me. That is a profound sacrifice. If one use that word. But it's also a profound joy to truly know who you are. Enable and for us to be enabled to do that we follow Jesus. We do not demand that Jesus follows us. And that's where we were there for a moment. On the road to Caesarea Philippi, when Peter looked at Jesus and said, no, we're not going to think that way. You're going to follow us. You're going to follow our idea of what Messiah means. And so Jesus says to Peter, no. You have to get behind me. You have to follow me. And Peter, if you can't, then you can't be my disciple. And so here we are in Lent in these 40 days. And we are asked to hear these words from Jesus directed to us. What part of myself might I be called upon to deny? What part of me needs to change so that I can be a one who follows Christ rather than one who asks Christ, follow me? God bless you on your journey. Amen. Our prayer response. O Lord, we give you thanks for the example of Abraham and Sarah and all the saints who have gone before us. For those who waited in patience for your promises to come to pass. For those who live in hope while around them it seems to be only darkness. For those who witnessed to you when it was not considered the proper things to do, for those who forgot their own self and their desire to obey your commands and respond to your call upon their lives, help us today to examine the level of our faith, to look seriously at our resistance, to talk about the cross and about sacrifice 
and to consider in prayer our reluctance to give up the things of this world for the sake of you and others. Lord, hear our prayer, and in your love, help us to hear your answer. In our Christ we pray, Amen. Let us receive our benediction. God's promises endures from generation to generation. May the God of Abraham and Sarah, the God who sent Jesus to redeem us, the God whose covenant is eternal, bless you and make you fruitful. Amen.